Hi everybody, welcome to week five. And this week I want to talk about this idea of problem definition. And as you know, um, problem definition is the next due in uh, for your term project. Where I'm going to ask you to do that, to uh, provide your problem definition for the policy that you are analyzing. So let's move into this. And um, as I do, remember, of course, that the lectures, I try to supplement what you're reading and give you some more things to think about. Um, and so definitely combine this with the readings. OK, so, you know, last week I talked a little bit about this idea of policy narratives and and we use this uh, policy of Social Security as an example. So, um, you know, thinking about stories, telling stories about policy probably seems like a fringe idea to a lot of people. Um, it isn't. Um, in my mind, it, the, the telling of stories really is what makes us human. I think I mentioned that. Um, you know, in addition to us going about always trying to find rare treasures like Indiana Jones did, um, archaeology is um, really a science and an art, but a science that really tries to understand the stories that ancients, whether those ancients lived 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago, were trying to tell their contemporaries and also tell future generations. So we do the same thing, right? We, we try to understand um, the messages and the stories that we have to tell. So we tell stories all the time. Nonprofits and government organizations, they always tell their story and deliver their message um, in a lot of ways, but on their, their virtual presence, their websites, their you know Facebook feed, their Twitter feed. So when somebody just says Red Cross, what does that connote to you? Um, it might connote a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and we use shorthands to really identify well-developed narratives when we're talking about important ideas. Um, lots of times we do that really without much knowledge of the antecedent conditions. So like, what do you think about when you hear the terms like North Korea? What do you think about when you hear the, the name Ebenezer Scrooge? Or when you hear the Declaration of Independence? Um, so there are connotations and all kinds of built-in stories packed into those terms um, that might have different variations depending on who you're talking to. But the point is that those really, those shorthand titles bring a lot of narrative with them. And so we do the same thing in policy, don't we? Uh, for example, um, you know, we can take about four different policy areas here, as I list in the left-hand column of this table. So welfare. We have this competition of narratives between the so-called welfare queen, which was, it's really a pejorative term, um, but it was popularized in the 1980s. But the welfare queen versus the mother in need of a hand up. Um, we think of the policy area of national defense. And so we can think of competing narratives like peace through strength versus the military industrial complex. And again, those terms, really have a lot of meaning packed in them. Um, a policy area concerning energy, really, I said fossil fuels, but um, energy really transition from polluting energy, which fossil fuels are by definition, a polluting form of energy um, versus using our natural resources for America. Um, so is fossil fuel polluting energy or is it just simply using our natural resources for the good of America? And then you can add on to that uh, the larger policy area of energy and, you know, should we transition from fossil fuels to renewables? And what, what do those things connote? And if you look at the history of the use of atomic energy or nuclear energy, you know, from the late 1940s, 1950s on, um, there were competing narratives there as well. Um, national education standards. Um, you know, we have one narrative of improving national educational outcomes um, versus the narrative of maintaining local control of public schools. So we often have these narratives that compete with each other. And that's in and of itself something that should be expected. However, um, where, where the uh, narratives become problematic 
in my mind when we we latch on to them too heavily uh, and they really take the place of analysis and for us that that is a problem because analysis should not simply be the rehashing of narrative but it should it should be a way of actually looking at policy to understand the costs the benefits and what it's really going to do for us so um, you know when we define a problem um, in our policy briefs for this class but just in general when we define a problem we really need to make sure we know what we mean um, in terms of this is a problem and we need to make sure that the people who read what we're talking about understand what we define as the problem right um, so the question is do policymakers always make their problem statements clear and by policymakers in in this context i'm really talking about uh, elected leaders because we're going to do an exercise um, with the um, nebraska legislature here for this week's um, uh, discussion but i i, I want to do that because i want to I want to dis discover really whether legislators in 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 this sense actually make their 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 problem statement and their intent clear um, so for purposes of this class we're using a step-by-step -step approach to this project and we're starting with this idea of problem definition because I think it's really important to move from a broad policy area to a specific policy. It's really important to understand what you're trying to analyze. And then from there, it's necessary to look at the specific policy problem um, for which alternatives can be analyzed. And then it's vital to um, that your problem definition in all that sets up some way of measuring the outcomes or some means of comparing policy alternatives. So this is why a policy problem definition becomes very important because if we're if if our problem definition is somewhat fuzzy then when we analyze um, there's some question uh, as to what we're actually analyzing and if we've actually presented alternatives that solve the problem so just real brief just a review of the Bardak text here is Bardak's eightfold path right um, and again the eightfold path is not the way I, I have this project constructed necessarily and parts of it line up but but really this eightfold path idea is a way of thinking and it, as you get into the bardak text you kind of see that right it's it's a way of approaching um the the idea of policy analysis and in fact i'd say it's really a way of uh, approaching problem solving in general and you've looked at you've actually looked at decision making in other classes and looked at the various models of decision making but but really this is in one sense a model of decision making right um, you define the problem and then once you've done that in a solid way you assemble some evidence or that relates to it then you construct alternatives for how to solve the problem then you have to have some kind of criteria that applies to all the alternatives and then you project the outcomes in other words okay if I do this what's it going to look like in two years five years ten years which again is what the CBO does with every piece of uh, legislation in Congress um, then we confront the trade-offs and that's talking about opportunity costs right if I do this what am I foregoing or if I if I don't do this what could I do um, that might be better and then finally Bardek asks you to stop focus narrow deepen and decide you know what he's talking about with that is actually reconsider what you've done and basically repeat it out loud and then finally get to the point of telling your story and that is why uh, for purposes of this class I have you devise this presentation to help you tell that story so let's talk about defining the problem in the Bardak text um, so here's what Bardak says in the in the pages you read this week um first they say make the problem definition evaluative that means um people can at least see your logic they might not agree with you but they can see your logic um through the evalu 
evaluative uh, way that you state the problem. So what Bardex talking about here is they suggest state the problem um, in terms of a deficit, right? What what is missing here? So that's where, where they talk about identify some kind of deficit. So there's about three different kinds of deficits they talk about, right? Market failure, social failure, or government failure. So think of some examples there. So market failure, the, one of the classic ones that we can think of is that um, uh, factories, for example, produce air pollution in the manufacture of their items. And so we've, we think of air pollution as an externality in the market. In other words, the the automobile for example that's being manufactured in the plant we pay a market price for you know based on uh, the fixed costs and the variable costs of the manufacturer so the plant um, the upkeep of the plant the machinery the personnel that are hired the utilities their supply chain and so we we pay this price based on um, those cost factors but often we classically haven't paid for the externality of the air pollution that has resulted so the air pollution has downstream effects but how do we capture that there's a market failure in that it's hard for us to capture those kinds of externalities what's a social failure so a social failure really you can think of in terms of you know are we living up to our social contract that we have in the United States. Um, so really civil rights legislation, um, you know, from the 50s and 60s forward really have been about um, addressing what we could call a social failure, right? We, we in fact did not treat all persons equally and we could argue that we still have problems in this area. And so we have come up with, uh, policy prescriptions for addressing those. Um, we can think in terms of government failure. So um, related to social failure is um, voting access. Um, we had the Voting Rights Act in 1965 to address the social failure and the government failure of disenfranchising, you know, an entire part of the population, specifically African Americans. But now we see ourselves uh, struggling with government failure, and that is, are our voting systems um, actually working for everyone in terms of what the government is supposed to do, um, you know, in terms of recognizing um, having the, the infrastructure in place to ensure that people can vote properly. Um, so Bardek advises you to um, avoid issue rhetoric. And, and what he's saying by that is don't start out your, um, your policy analysis with kind of the partisan viewpoint um, that you can get on any issue um, across the board. Uh, why? Because what that does really is it, it there's probably going to be some bias uh, in everything all of us write, but um, don't start out by biasing your study um, by saying, it, you know, basically everything we're doing right now is completely wrong um, and let's fix it. Um, that could be the case, but of, try to avoid that issue rhetoric. And so he gives you a few other tips on defining the problem, talks about recognizing uncertainty, which we should always do in every every kind of project that we undertake there is always uncertainty um we should quantify if possible i thought it was interesting that um uh the bardek book talks about quantifying if possible um and quantifying things does not have to involve um, as i say later on a lot of esoteric statistics it could be just uh, some descriptive statistics or numbers that really give you the idea and then you should diagnose the conditions. In other words, what actually has caused this to occur? Um, identify latent opportunities, which is interesting. There's a couple pages in the book on that, but I also um, just want to make a plug. I gave you a about a 21 minute video from Planet Money, which I like to listen to from one of their podcasts where they talk about um, 
dividing uh, dividing things up. Actually, it's kind of it's kind of an interesting uh, podcast where the policy uh, area that they're addressing ultimately in that has to do with the public harbors in Santa Cruz, California. Um, so it's, that's a real just a really interesting little look at how economics has presents a um, a latent opportunity for a local manager and then avoid some pitfalls that is what they're talking about is don't s smuggle in your solutions right away with your problem definition and then finally iterate meaning simply um, go back and look at that and see if it makes sense to you so you know, in the craft text this is how they approach um, the the idea of of policy analysis, a shorter path really. So they say define and analyze the problem, then construct alternatives, then choose evaluative criteria, assess the alternatives and draw conclusions. So um, they leave out a couple steps, but still really in all, this is a, a solid decision-making model for, um, for uh, policy analysis. Okay, so let's talk about defining the problem using the craft text. So, so first of all, define. So what is the nature of the problem and, and what is the context? Second, um, quantify the problem. So again, that doesn't necessarily call for esoteric statistics, really. It could just be descriptive statistics. Then third, determine the extent or magnitude. Um, You know, so you measured it, but okay, so what does that really mean compared to what? And then think about causes. How did this happen? You know, what caused this to happen? And then start to set goals or objectives. So what are some possible means to the end? And then finally determine what can be done, what is feasible. Those last two things are really things you can start thinking about, but you know, it's not something you're gonna put in your problem statement right away. <laughs> So I thought I would um, I thought I would think about one of the, the issues with um, the problem of defining the problem. I guess I could say it that way. The the def the problem of defining the problem really is that um, sometimes the area really has a lot of problems associated with it. So I'm using healthcare as an example here. Um, you might for this part of the presentation for these two slides these next two slides go back after you, you view the presentation and you can click on the links on the PowerPoint version of this um, the non narration portion and see all these links where I got all this um, kind of the background information here but this gives you an idea of if you were looking at healthcare as a problem area there's there's a whole raft of problems and I only I only talked about a few but there's a whole lot of problems you could talk about and really look at different policies for each one of these specific areas so um, here's the problem with healthcare number one catastrophic healthcare is unaffordable um, th there is a study this is actually a scholarly study that I linked to you here to that um, talks about early breast stage breast cancer, for example, the allowable amount, that's the amount that insurance companies pay, um, costs uh, an average of around $73,000 for a 36 month treatment regimen. So that means um, that if a woman had breast cancer detected in stage zero, um, er, very early stage breast cancer, but still had, for example, a lumpectomy and then some follow-up treatment, for example, um, either um, radiation or chemotherapy over the course of the, about the next three years um, the first year and then the uh, about two years of observation for the that would be about seventy three thousand dollars and the costs go up from there you know depending on the stage of cancer that is caught and uh, as it turns out actually breast cancer while very um, prevalent and um, actually is is a cancer that in terms of monetary costs costs a lot less than a lot of other kinds of cancer per patient however you know in the aggregate we are spending a lot on breast cancer so catastrophic health care is unaffordable meaning if you didn't have insurance could you afford seventy three thousand dollars for 36 months of treatment that regimen
and that's just the average cost. Uh, a second problem is a large number of non-elderly persons are uninsured. So in, in 2013, prior to the Affordable Care Act, about 44 million persons, non-elderly persons in the United States were without insurance. And now that, that number has gone down to about 27.4 million, but it's still a fairly uh, high number. Um, a third problem, in terms of insurance, we have a somewhat confusing array of coverages in the U.S. And this link goes to the Kaiser Family Foundation, and it just talks about the percentage of persons insured in each state uh, in terms of private insurance or Medicare or Medicaid or some other kind of insurance and the number of persons uninsured. Um, and what you see just by looking at that chart is that just in terms of insurance, we have uh, a lot of different kinds of of insurances in the United States. And that doesn't even speak to the, the variation of coverage within particular kinds of insurance. Um, some other problems with healthcare. There's a shortage of rural physicians. Um, I link you to an article from US News and World Report in 2018. Um, there is a shortage of primary care doctors. Sometimes those two are actually linked together. Primary care doctors in rural areas, but there's a shortage of primary care doctors in general. And then finally, really, this is a healthcare problem in the United States. A large portion of our population does not practice preventative health care, meaning eat right and exercise right. So we have this issue that in excess of 30% of our adult population is, is obese. Um, it fits the clinical definition for obesity. And then uh, less than 25% in this other article that I link here, uh, less than 25% of adults exercise regularly, you know, to the extent that it actually does them any, uh, pays them any cardiovascular benefits. So I, I talked about six or seven different problems with healthcare here. Um, so what have we talked about uh, for the last, uh, since the Obama presidency into the Trump presidency vis-a-vis uh, -vis healthcare? We, We've, we've uh, tried to celebrate or attack one particular law. And as long as we do that, uh, my contention is we're really not getting at problems in healthcare. We're just talking about one particular law, the Affordable Care Act. And really the Affordable Care Act did actually try to solve a lot of issues in um, healthcare, uh, not the least of which was insurance, but um, the point is that if if you wanted to say, I'm going to analyze health care, this is one where you'd really want to spend some time defining what your problem statement is. Some policy areas are a lot more simple than this, right? However, many are as complicated as this. And so it's important to understand what we're talking about when we define problems with a policy area. So here's another example, a little simpler. So I thought about problem definition and inattentive driving. So um, taking after the, the craft text, I, I wanted to start to talk about, think about problem definition if you wanted to talk about inattentive driving. So what is the nature of the problem? Um, well, when a driver is inattentive to road conditions, they that person can veer into other lanes or fail to slow or stop the car when required. So that's just really, kind of the the physical definition of inattentive driving so if a person's inattentive they can uh, it can lead to outcomes of driving the car that aren't desired like veering into another lane or not being able to stop the car but inattentive driving might be caused by several things right and we typically think of texting while you're driving using a handheld device but it could also be caused by things like tuning your radio, eating while you're driving, talking to other occupants, like turning around and making sure your baby's okay. Um, and oh, I in included a, a YouTube uh, video from California um, in 2016 that, that talks about the law they passed. That's kind of putting the cart before the horse, but it's interesting. Um, but how would we measure inattentive driving? And this has to do with your problem definition, right? Um, you can't just say inattentive driving is a problem. Uh, well, you could talk about it in terms of accident statistics from the state and look for listed causes. So you could say, well, there have been, you know, X amount of accidents. Um, 
caused by inattentive driving. But how do we determine magnitude, which is the next thing the craft text advises? So what percentage of those accidents um, were, were, were caused by inattentive driving? So was it 5%, 10%, 50%? Um, for added emphasis, you'd probably start talking about uh, the data involving fatalities. How many accidents involving fatalities uh, had inattentive driving as a causal factor. And then finally, what's our goal? Well, our goal is to find the best way to prevent drivers from, from inattentive driving. So can we isolate these factors? Can we say, you know, the large majority of these are due to using a device while driving? You know, what about the others like eating a hamburger uh, while you're driving or, you know, singing along with the radio. What what about all these things that also could be considered inattentive driving? And then you kind of start getting to, okay, what's feasible in terms of policy? But again, for your problem definition itself, what's feasible in terms of policy is not necessary to talk about, but it's something that you should be thinking about. And I, and I say that because of this. This comes right out of the craft text. This is actually one of craft slides. Um, this is actually page 165 of the text. I like the chart on page 165 better because it has some nice icons. But, um, you know, there's several instruments of public policy, right? So one of the problems with policy uh, analysis is that we can, we can bias our policy analysis or we can sort of front load our policy analysis by starting to think of what can the government do before we actually define the problem? And I think this is a natural tendency, by the way, that people engage in, right? So the government can regulate, right? We, we can regulate externalities like pollution, and we have done that. But should you say regulation is the answer before we fully flushed out the problem? We can subsidize, right? We have subsidized um, renewable energy. We can impose taxes or give tax deductions. We do that in a lot of areas, right? To encourage certain types of behavior. We can give market incentives, right? And again, we have done that for various kinds of uh, enterprises to do the things that we'd like them to do on behalf of the American people. Charge fees for specific purposes. We can educate, conduct research provide direct services, privatize or contract out or create public trust. So government does all these things. All these things are instruments of public policy. But the important thing in relation to policy definition to keep in mind and why I'm doing this is we have to separate the means of doing something, not just from the ends or the outcomes, but from the problem itself, which is, you know, what is the why of why we want to government to do something or why we want public policy. And we may find that our problem definition ends up leading us in a direction that doesn't have to do with regulation, that doesn't have to do with taxes. We might lead in the direction of market incentives. We might lead in the direction of educating the population. So um, depending on what our policy problem is, we can select different instruments. So um, kind of having talked about all that, I want to talk about uh, your problem definition uh, assignment of this project, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and so what I'm asking you to do in this first kind of substantive stage of your, your um, term project beyond telling me what you're going to write on is, I want you to provide the context and background of the problem. So this is the part where you should already be researching the problem itself. So you want to become familiar with the context of the problem. Um, that's what's driving it and the background of the problem and then develop a problem policy argument um, as we've been discussing here. Um, so your argument is going to explain why the problem needs to be addressed. So remember in this simulation for this class, that you are working for a policymaker client, for example, um, and your job is to be able to make that person 
have the ability to explain why the policy needs to be uh, created and what the alternatives are. So this helps you, you know, identifying that audience, by the way, the reason I have you do that is because it really helps you think about the level of the problem and it helps you focus on your audience, right? So is this really a problem within this leader's purview? Um, so the police have, the, the police chief in Omaha isn't going to uh, really have a lot to say about tax policy, for example. So, so the idea is that policy does have often an appropriate level, and this helps you think about that. So then what I'd like you to do is present the adequate background so that the reader, any reader, can understand the policy issue. And then you're gonna write enough so the reader can understand why the policy should be developed or changed, and that is your problem statement. That's how you, you're going to present the problem. That's why I give you about three to six pages to be able to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears real quick. Um, I'd like you to do a, a little bit of an exercise this week on the discussion board, and that is talk about policy um, from the standpoint of a, legislato a legislator in the Nebraska legislature. So I'm going to give you some screenshots, but what I'd like you to do is go to the Nebraska legislature site. Some of you have worked for the legislature, so you're very familiar with this. Um, but I'm going to give you some screenshots to show you what I want you to do. But here's what I want you to do. Every year, um, every session, um, almost all the legislators introduce legislation. It'd be pretty unusual if they didn't. Um, but they have a reason for doing that. That is there is some problem that they perceive that they're trying to solve. But what we want to do here is we want to look at some of um, the introduced bills and see if you think um, they're doing a good job with this. So um, I'm going to have you look at some bills that have been introduced already in this current session, 2019. I'm, I'm trying to see if you can decipher the, the senator's policy intent. I'm trying to see if you can figure out what the problem was and what were its causes, just based on what the, the proposal is. Um, how's the problem gonna be solved? That is really, what's the instrument that's gonna be used? And how, what are the outcomes of the policy purported to be? And how are the outcomes gonna get measured? So the first thing you wanna do is go to nebraskalegislature.gov right up there at the top of the address area. And this page will pop up for you when you go to nebraskalegislature.gov. So I want you to, you can, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, please spend some time navigating the site. There's there's a lot more to this site than I'm gonna take you through, um, way more, um, including uh, updates, you know, everything that's going on in the current session. Um, you can also find, you know, the Nebraska constitution, you can find, codified law. There's all kinds of stuff that you can find on this site. But for the purpose of this, of this exercise, I'd like you to go down to where I have the red arrow in the middle there and click on introduce legislation. That's going to take you to legislation that's been introduced in this term so far. So when you do that, a page like this is going to pop up. It might actually look different depending on the day you do it because this gets updated. But it'll look something like this. Um, I'm going to have you click on specific pieces of legislation, but avoid the ones on the top of this page. It has um, some that were introduced by the executive board. You can see some some legislation is um, introduced by every year by um, boards and committees of the legislature. What I'm going to have you look at is legislation introduced by specific senators. So. But this is what the page is going to look like, and every one of these you can you can actually click on. So for an example of what I'd like you to do, I picked one piece of legislation, LB13, which was introduced by Senator Carol Blood of Bellevue. As you can see that uh, on on the um, that first gray bar, it says document info, then text copies and additional info. So this is introduced by blood, date of introduction, January 10th, 
2019. So LB13 is called provide a sales tax exemption for breast pumps and related supplies and exempt breast pump feeding from public indecency offensive uh, offenses. So let me scroll down a little bit more to this, to where that red arrow is. You see the red arrow there on the right? It has statement of intent and fiscal note. It's really the statement of intent um, and sometimes the fiscal note that I want you to look at for this exercise. The statement of intent um, is really why the particular senator introduced a bill. Okay, so here is the statement of intent from written by Senator Carol Blood. You can see right at the bottom there, it says principal introducer, Senator Carol Blood. And um, it's to the revenue committee. So the statement of intent is written to the particular committee. So what this says is the following constitutes the reasons for this bill and the purposes which are sought to be accomplished thereby. And she says LB 13 amends the Nebraska Revenue Act of 1967 so that sales and use taxes shall not be imposed on breast pumps intended for home use, the repair and replacement parts for those pumps, breast pump collection and storage supplies and breast pads. LB 13 also amends 28-806 to explicitly exempt a breastfeeding mother from Nebraska's public indecency laws. So this is what Senator Blood says this law is supposed to do. So what I, I'd like you to do from this most of the, the bills have a brief statement of intent. But what I'd like you to do in this exercise is see if you can use these statements of intent to um, kind of build backwards and figure out the public policy problem that you think this senator was addressing with this particular bill. Um, don't use this one because I used it as an example, but use other bills. And now there's an additional thing in this one, and not all bills have this, uh, but a fiscal note. So a fiscal note says that there's some cost involved with the bill. Okay, so that should have been clear because what Senator Blood's bill proposes is to exempt particular items from sales tax. So if we're exempting items from sales tax, there is a revenue cost to the state in doing that. So right here, um, the, the fiscal note is not prepared by, um, this is prepared by the legislative fiscal uh, analysis people, um, but there's always uh, there, a fiscal note if revenue is involved. So you can see in this that for the next two bienniums, that is 2019 and 2020, and then 2020 through 2021, there is a cost to the state of $203,000 in lost revenue in the first biennium and $302,000 in lost um, sales tax revenue in that second biennium. So $500,000 approximately, $505,000 of foregone um, sales tax revenue uh, to the state. So a fiscal note actually is part of, um, when, there's, when there's revenue involved, it has to be included with the bill. Okay, so here is the discussion question, and this is what I'd like you to do for this exercise, and please let me know if, if it's not clear, but I'd like you from that list of bills for this session to sample about 10 to 15 bills from the list. Um, and then on those bills, they don't all have a statement of intent. Most do though. So find, one, find those with statements of intent in the upper right-hand corner. And I'd like you to read the statement of intent uh, for the sample of the bills you selected, um, and then and then ask this question, how well do the statements of intent express a policy problem uh, in, in the statement? Is there clarity or ambiguity, ambiguity? And does the statement of intent as written seem to provide a clear path for administrators to follow if the, if the bill were put into law? So what I'm really asking you to do uh, is, is see if this makes sense to you as a, an observer of the legislature. When the, when the senator says, this is what this bill is designed to do, and they write the statement of intent, I want you to ask, okay, does that really make sense? So again, let me know if you have questions on this exercise. Um, otherwise, I'm looking forward to your answers, and this will have the purpose of um, familiarizing you a little bit more with the state uh, legislative site. Thank you.